What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ardell and in today's video we cover a great game by Anthony Miles, also often referred to as Tony Miles, who was the first ever Englishman to earn the Grandmaster title. And this game is often considered to be one of the greatest hippopotamus defense games of all time. Now what are we trying to get and achieve in this setup? Well really we're trying to get both of our bishops fianchettoed on g7 as well as b7, putting our central pawns on e6 and d6, putting those knights right behind those two central pawns, and then putting the pawns on either a6, h6, or both. It may seem a little bit passive, but it's extremely solid, and it's going to give us attacking chances, and at the same time, no real weaknesses. Here white starts off the game with d4, and we now see Miles continue with e6, followed by b6, a little e6, b6 system. But now after the move a3, he obviously mixes things up and goes with this move g6, putting pieces quickly behind on g7, e7, and b7 and here following the move bishop d3 it's very obvious here white is trying to get an aggressive setup in the center of the board and really fight for that win but we now just see this move d6 and against castling king side knight d7 and following rookie one we see this move h6 followed by a6 from miles and notice here how white has played very solid chess so far castling king side a rook on e1 and they have a very solid center but it's going to be hard for white to break through in the center especially without giving us any kind of activity notice here guys if a move like d5 is played our bishop on g7 will become alive and our knight on d7 is also going to be eyeing key squares such as e5 and c5 and on top of that if we ever do see a move like d5 we can always just close things up if we'd like to with a move like e5 or just keep the tension in the center of the board and play a move here like castling king side it's really up to you and the kind of direction that you want to go in a game like this on the flip side if white ever breaks through with the move e5 our bishop on b7 becomes alive and here in this position yeah white technically has enough pieces defending this pawn at the moment but guys this isn't going to last long as we're going to remove a defender and then the very next move, just snatch off this pawn. And notice here how white cannot just keep capturing back because of knight takes e5, our knight becoming active in the center of the board, attacking the queen, attacking the bishop, and guys, black is on the brink of winning this game. So here, instead of a move like d5 or e5 from white, which really gives black a ton of ideas and counterattacking chances, we see bishop e3. And this is very common. You're going to see this quite a bit if you're playing the hippo. White gets the center, and then they're simply just trying to hold on to it with everything they can. But guys, the hippo isn't just about reading and reacting, but also creating your own initiative. And we see two key ideas in this position, starting off with g5, taking control of both f4 and h4, and really just creating a presence and some space on the king side of the board with a move like g5, knight g6 is a key idea, also attacking both of those squares. And now against this move rook c1, we see a second idea used by Miles, and that is using a flank pawn to put pressure in the center of the board. And that's exactly what we see, except with the C pawn putting pressure on D4, white responding by pushing in the center. And notice what we just did here. We used a flank pawn to get this pawn to D5. And in return, we have nice control of both of these dark squares right in the center on D4 and E5. And we now see knight G6. As I mentioned, this move goes very well with the move of G5. I mean, they're really just attacking the same squares. And on top of that, this square of E5 is attacked by not one or two, but three of our minor pieces. And notice at the same time, by white doing this, this bishop on d3 has really become a tall pawn. So we see this move bishop c2, bringing this bishop back, trying to give white a little bit more breathing room, but black just continues to naturally develop with queen e7. And against queen d2, simply castles kingside. We now see this move rook cd1, and this is something I see quite a bit whenever I look at top-level hippopotamus defense games. It's often hard for the opponent to know exactly what to do. White played this move rook c1, and then played queen d2, and then played the move rook d1. After that, guys, notice how white just wasted a tempo, and in return, we are going to gain time, and we're going to gain attacking chances. It's just hard for white to know what black's going to do, and even if white does try to do anything in the center, it's going to give us some activity. In this instance, we play the move knight d e5, attacking this pawn on c4, and white can actually fall into trouble very quickly here. For example, let's say white tries to defend this pawn on c4 by playing a move like b3. Well, now we're able to take off this knight and notice what we're trying to do. We're trying to really mess up this pawn structure on the king side. In fact, right now we can play queen f6, attacking both the pawn on f3 and this knight, which isn't even defended except for this queen on d2. Guys, this position is over a minus four advantage for black, and I just don't see how white's going to survive very long because there's no way for white to hold on to both here.
So a move like b3 doesn't work because we simply capture on f3, damaging white's pawn structure, continue with queen f6, and we're going to have a one game. What about this move bishop d3, trying to hang on to the pawn? Well, in a similar sense, we are just going to take that knight right off the board, and here queen f6 probably isn't the best idea because obviously this knight is now defended by the pawn on b2, but okay, we play a move like bishop e5. We do have knight h4 ideas in the air attacking this pawn full control of these dark squares queen f6 now on the way that our bishop on e5 is more active and guys in a position like this black is in the driver's seat so y'all bishop d3 doesn't work because we're still able to damage white's pawn structure play bishop e5 queen f6 knight h4 you get the idea we're going after that king on g1 so here we see the move knight takes e5 and then the move bishop d3 but again we see queen f6 just slowly trying to improve the positioning of our pieces and really take control of these dark scores while also putting a little bit of pressure on this knight on c3. But at the same time, by putting all of our pieces on the king side here, we are neglecting a little bit our pawn on b6. So white tries to go after this with the move of knight a4. And here black could have played a move like queen d8 trying to hold on to this pawn. But Miles didn't really care about losing this pawn, but just plays this move rook a b8, allowing white to win this pawn on b7. And guys, notice here we could try to even out the material here, but this move bishop takes b2 simply runs into knight d7, which forks both our queen and our rook on b8. So instead we see this move bishop c8 attacking this knight. Now white could have taken the bishop on c8, but white was probably a little bit uncomfortable with Miles being able to take this pawn on b2, forcing this queen to a square like c1 or even a5, in which case rook takes c8 is played. We have a rook on the second rank, as always, our three pieces here are extremely active, and it's going to be very easy for this rook to just slide over one step to the right and become involved as well. So I do understand why white was a little bit uncomfortable with this line. And on top of that, I mean, this queen on a5 is going to have a hard time getting back into the defense at all. And if we brought this queen to c1 instead of the square of c5, it's still very inactive. I'm taking black here any day of the week. So here white decides not to take on c8, but instead brings this knight back to a4 and here from black we see the move bishop d7 but notice how miles wasn't in a rush to try to even out the material guys in your own games when you're playing for attacking chances and your opponent's pieces are awkwardly placed don't feel the need to try to even out the material right away because it could give up your attacking chances now in this instance it actually just gives up material because of this move rook b1 obviously attacking the bishop and this bishop's about to get picked off because if we move it out of the way we simply lose a rook so Miles here is not in any kind of rush to try to get material back, but just plays this move, Bishop d7, allowing the knight to go back to the square of c3. And here for Miles, rook b3. I love this idea from black. I mean, just activating this major piece, attacking both c3 and b2 now. And notice how a move like Bishop c2 can't be played to kick it out, because in that case, we're simply going to snatch that pawn off on b2. So here we see the move rook b1, white trying to hold on to their extra pawn. And now black continuing with rook fb8 forming a battery ram against that pawn on b2. And again, just putting a ton of pressure on the white camp here. We now see white continue with this move of knight d1. White originally played knight a4 and then snatched that pawn off on b6. And then brought this knight all the way back to d1. And in the meantime, we've really been able to activate some of our major pieces putting a ton of pressure on the white camp here. And again, guys, we could actually play this move bishop takes b2 without losing material. We'd be able to even out the material in this game. But guys, again, in a position like this, don't feel the need to necessarily just get even material and then go on into an end game. Guys, we have the better game here. White's pieces are extremely inactive and our pieces are very well placed. Let's keep fighting for the win and let's start looking towards the king side of the board now. White has spent so much time trying to defend this pawn on b2. I mean, right now the rook, knight, and queen are all trying to hold on to that pawn. And at the same time, there's not really any good defenders for this king on g1 right now. So let's just take on d5, activating our bishop on d7. And then here after the move, c takes d5, we see knight f4, getting our knight into the action, attacking some very key light scores. In fact, right now, just threatening to win this bishop. We see white continue with bishop takes f4. I personally think that bishop f1 was probably a better idea, just getting this bishop back and trying to hold on to those key light squares. But here we see the move bishop takes f4. And guys, at first sight, this seems like a very good option. In fact, white may have been a little bit confused on why knight f4 is played, allowing white to give up a somewhat okay piece for a very strong knight. But here we see Miles create an imbalance by not taking with the queen or 
the bishop, but instead playing g takes f4. And I know that some of you are probably wondering, wait, doesn't that give black double isolated and isolated pawns? Isn't this a bad idea? Well, guys, it is a general rule to not get double pawns, especially double isolated pawns. But guys, general rules are just that general rules that are made to be stretched in the right situation. The reason that we're able to take with the G pawn is because of this very key G file from G8 to G1 attacking that king on G1. And we're obviously going to see this pay off later on in the game. We see bishop C2 from white here, obviously trying to get rid of this very annoying rook on that b3 square but here guys miles doesn't play a passive move such as rook b6 but actually plays the move of the game rook takes h3 absolutely brilliant idea and i think that a lot of this move simply came off of intuition and feeling out this game and realizing that white doesn't have any kind of defense obviously if white doesn't want to take our rook on h3 we're going to have a rook on h3 which is obviously very active and here against the move g takes h3 which is what happened in the game we now don't see miles feel the need to try to checkmate this king in two or three moves but simply slide this king on g8 over to the left one square and we now see that g takes f4 is paying off we want to bring our rook into the g8 square and guys again i mean it's not like there's any kind of forced mate in a position like this but at the same time what defenders does this king have i mean both of these rooks aren't offering much help and obviously both of the minor pieces and the queen are on the queen side of the board there's no way that either of these minor pieces are going to get over to the king side anytime soon here white could have played a move like king f1 trying to get this king the heck out of here and this is a decent idea but here with black we could simply play this move rook g8 notice how i did not take on h3 with a check now for most players including myself this is very tempting i mean why not just snatch up a pawn get a little bit of material back and attack that king but guys notice the activity of this bishop is actually two-sided we are aimed towards the king side but we're also eyeing this very key b5 square notice here if white tries to play something like king e2 we're now going to play f3 check and following king d3 white trying to survive but we now have this very key bishop b5 check attacking the king forcing this king back and after queen f4 this game would have been over so here guys we don't see white try to make a run for it because of that very key bishop b5 check idea and obviously these pieces on d2 and c2 are getting in the king's way instead we see this move f3 from white probably trying to give white a little bit more room to try to get some more defensive pieces involved but now from black we just see rook g8 with check against this king and again i mean white could have played a move here like king f1 but in that case we're simply going to play queen h4 and bishop takes a2 check white could have also played a move like king f2 but okay we're going to play queen h4 check followed by an idea like rook g2 with check i mean no matter how you cut this up a black's gonna get the win here we see king h1 from white but this just allows black to play queen h4 attacking this pawn h3 and it's here that white actually resigns the game i mean the reason for this is that we're simply going to pick off this pawn also looking at the f3 pawn once we capture on h3 with the queen and here if white tries to hang on to the pawn with a move like queen h2 okay thank you for the rook and that game's going to be over in just one move and here if white tries to hang on with a move like knight f2 we're still just going to take the pawn right off the board this bishop is about to move out of the way and we're going to have that king in a mating net and here if white takes the bishop we're simply going to take back and obviously i mean queen h2 we're going to snatch off that pawn take the queen and this would have been a game over thanks for watching today's video if you'd like to learn the theory behind the hippopotamus defense click that video to the left if you'd like to see a game by simon williams scoring him a big win click that video to the right leave a comment down below let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel and as always i appreciate you guys thanks for watching peace